Good morning. My name is Morgan Snope, and I started coming to United Parish back in November, I think. Uh, and I am just a little bit nervous to be reading scripture for you this morning. <laughs> this morning, we remember what it means to keep Sabbath, just as we send our senior pastor on his period of sabbatical. Let us open our ears, our minds, our imaginations, and listen across time and space to hear God's wisdom in these words. From the first account of creation in Genesis, we read, On the sixth day, God completed all the work that God had done, and on the seventh day, God rested from all the work that he had done, that they had done. God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it, God rested from all the work of creation. From the book of Exodus, we hear the fourth of the Ten Commandments. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreign residing in, foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. But God rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the, blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy." And we remember the, from Mark's gospel how the Pharisees criticized Jesus for picking grain on the Sabbath day. He responded, the Sabbath was made for humans, not humans for the Sabbath. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God in spirit, for the word of God among us. Let us pray together. Sabbath rest of Galilee, O calm of hills above, where Jesus knelt to share with thee the silence of eternity interpreted by love. With thanks for the gift of Sabbath, God, we come before you, and may the words of our mouths and the meditations of all our hearts be truly acceptable in your sight. O oh God, our rock and our redeemer, let the people say, amen. amen. As we just heard Morgan read beautifully, thank you, Morgan. Six days you may work and do all your tasks, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. Do not do any work on it. And from the Gospel of Mark, Jesus, tweaking the Pharisees a little bit and teaching his disciples, says the Sabbath was created for humans. Humans were not created for the Sabbath. Now, I'm not going to see you for, for about four months, so I may go a little longer this morning. <laughs> Anybody remember what it was like seven years ago this month, February? February of 2015. Yes, I see some hands remembering well. We were in the middle of what we came later to term Snowmageddon. We were about four to five blizzards in at this point. They happened every week 
almost like clockwork between Saturday night and Monday morning. In fact, February 15th of that year was the first time we ever sort of moved worship online, which our efforts are so lame then by comparison of what we've learned over the past two, month, two years. And you may remember that the snow literally piled up around our eyeballs. And you may remember we, we couldn't find our cars, we couldn't find our bikes. It was felt like a nonstop Arctic slow moving hurricane. And then it started getting into our gutters and it started getting into our houses and there was leakage. We had our organ destroyed over here in the chapel to the tune of about $100,000. It was crazy. For the first time in my life, I literally wondered, is spring ever going to come again? And you also remember at that time, we had a young strapping facilities manager, Casey Hickson, who decided that he needed to go up on this flat part of the roof up here and shovel off some snow that had become about waist deep. And I was longing for some reason to feel relevant. And so I went up there with him, and it's one of the best days of work I had that year of my time, and one of the best days in my eight years with you. I went up there and shoveled with him because I actually like shoveling snow. And at that point, I liked that you had a goal. It was very clear, and we knew when we would be done with it. Unlike so much of what I and you and many of us do in the rest of our working lives. And we were up there, huffing and puffing away, making progress, getting the snow off the roof. And I was feeling good because I was keeping pace with a guy who was about half my age and probably twice my strength. And all of a sudden, after we were 45 to 60 minutes into it, he said, let's take a break. And I thought, wait, I'm, I'm good. We can keep up. You don't have to slow down for me. I'm okay. And he sort of insisted, and I thought, okay, well, we promoted you to facilities manager, so I will follow your lead on this one. I'm just merely a pastor trying to be helpful here. And I don't remember what happened in that break. We just kind of sat there and took a breath, took a moment. But it's funny sometimes how little things like that stick with you. Because when I shovel snow now, I remember it, especially if I'm starting to get tired. I remember it when I feel like I've been working hard and have no more energy left on problems I can't solve or can't figure out, either at work or in my own personal life. And I remember him just saying with authority, let's take a break. It reminded me of that parable of the two woodcutters, two guys who had a whole bunch of wood to cut, and they decided to vie with each other who could get it all done fastest. And the guy kept working away with his axe, cutting this wood, not stopping. And he kept noticing the other guy was taking a break every 30 to 45 minutes. He thought, okay, I'm going to get ahead of him here. This went on for hours. He kept taking a break, taking a break. Ah, this is good for me. I'm going to get ahead. And then when it was all said and done, the guy who kept taking the breaks had cut much more wood. He said, what were you doing? You were taking all those breaks. He said... I was sharpening my axe. I ask you in the blog this week, how many of you on a weekly basis regularly take a full 24-hour break from any work or anything that feels like work? Yes, Dot. Thank you, Dot. Okay, well, that's what I might have expected. As I wrote to you, when we live in a 24-7 culture, which is dominated by instant access and constantly buzzing electronic devices in an economy that's based on consumer demand and worker productivity, it's downright countercultural to say, let's take a break. I need to take a break. I must take a break. In fact, even acknowledging aloud, guess what? the God who created me and you and all of this, the ruler of the universe, the ground of all our being, our higher power. Yes, that God commands that I take a break. And it's probably the one commandment that we all feel pretty comfortable breaking regularly. It's in fact culturally sanctioned to break it. Now, I'm hoping and guessing most of us don't murder or steal or commit adultery, 
And we may try to be really good about not lying or coveting or disrespecting our parents. But power through and work on on my day off. Answer that next email. Do a few more chores here and there, though I'm dead tired. It means I'm a good person, right? I'm willing to go the extra mile to work harder, longer, faster. American ends in I can, right? Go, go, go. Do, do, do. Biblical scholar Walter Brueggemann wrote a book about this a few years ago called Sabbath as Resistance. Saying no in a culture of now. And he claims that you and I are caught up in a culture of restlessness, of anxiety, a market ideology in which the goal of life is to produce more and consume more. We consume more hours so we can produce more hours, so we can be richer and more powerful and more effective and more well thought of. The market ideology is a rat race that has infected us all, he says. And as the celebrated preacher William Sloan Coffin glibly put it, even if you're winning the rat race, you're still a rat. (laughs) You and I get seduced into thinking that productivity equals value. And as I've said repeatedly, we we get seduced into thinking that busyness equals value. Sabbath is this amazing thing in the Ten Commandments where it turns from the first three, where we honor God, to the last six, where we honor one another as our neighbors. It is pivotal to our faith. It is saying no to all that, that, that is out there in the market that controls us, that tells us how we ought to be, so that we can say yes to God, to the miracle of all that God has created, including ourselves. Now, I come to this Sabbath resistance quite naturally, even though I try to be really good about taking my Fridays off. But I was raised by two people who loved to go full tilt. They were hard workers, civic and church-minded, and they wanted to make a difference in the world, and they did. But they had trouble saying no to a good idea or big projects or a fun opportunity. And I think that's probably a big reason that I love all of you so much. Because this is a congregation full of more Marthas than Marys, of worker bees, of doers, of people who want to make a difference, who want their lives to matter, and who never get tired of good ideas. But the sobering thing for me is that both of my parents died of hearts that gave out before their will to live gave out. And in my mother's case, as many of you know, it was a really beautiful thing. I mean, she just couldn't get enough of living life to the fullest. She wanted to stay at the party as long as she could while God gave her more things to do. Start a new Bible study, play at the chapel services, break COVID precautions and drive up and down the coast. She was going at it long and hard until her heart or rather God, decided that 87 and a half was a good time for her to head on out to the next heavenly room. And I was with her when it happened. It was the most astounding thing. She said, Jesus, I'm ready to go. I hopped on a Zoom council meeting, and within two and a half hours, she was gone. It was just like calling a taxi. But in my father's case, he was essentially working three different jobs in an effort to save both his pension and do two jobs that he really loved, while covering for an employee who didn't show up for work that day. He died of a heart attack at age 58 in the basement of an unfinished house foundation, putting a support beam in place, overdoing it once again. And I just stop and wonder, often, if he'd had more of a practice of Sabbath, maybe he would have met his grandchildren. Maybe he would have struggled and I would have watched him struggle with me coming out and meeting the love of my life. Maybe he would still disagree yet respect my line of reasoning in politics. Maybe he would have seen me get ordained to be the kind of man he raised me to be and receive communion from my hands. And as I draw closer and closer to his death year, I can feel these questions breathing down my neck. Life is short, my friends, and we haven't much time to gladden the road 
of those who walk this journey with us. I'm pretty sure that one of the reasons that Sabbath made it so centrally into the commandments is because the Israelites were just coming out of an Egyptian culture of slave labor where Pharaoh forced them to do more and more with less and less. It's a lot like how our market economy works today. Forcing the working class to work harder and harder with less and less. And over 40 years, we've seen our fiscal policies and the corporation culture that's risen up around us, helping those who have more get more, and those who have less get less. And all of us have gotten caught up in this slavery mindset, mindset of a market-driven culture. After Egypt, out in the wilderness, I believe God wanted the chosen people to remember who they serve and to whom they belong. He said, Moses, you go down and tell them they don't belong to Pharaoh anymore. They don't belong to the man. They are not under that lash. They belong to me, the one who gave them life and who made all this possible. And I'm going to give them manna in the wilderness regularly. They need to trust and obey and listen. Because when we stop doing, even just for 24 hours, when we're willing to look up and see the beauty of God's glorious creation and how it's reflected in our own creatureliness and the wonders of these bodies we inhabit, we get to remember the astonishing gift of life. Because if we keep striving and working and worrying and doing all the time, we're liable to miss this altogether. Now, here in the United Parish, we have an innate tendency to do and be more. And our congregation and staff have brilliantly risen to the challenges of these past two years. We had Emmy-worthy online worship. Can I get an amen? We had all sorts of gatherings when we couldn't do them inside. We took them outside for sacred strolls and hikes and worship in the Memorial Park and on the garden. Amen? We actually provided more opportunities than less. Amen? Susan and the choir were heroic in making these audio recordings for us and still meeting every Thursday night. Amen? Amen. And Amy led our church school and the Children Youth Deepening team to worship online and then worship on the front lawn and then worship upstairs. Amen? Amen? And Thrifty Threads kept going with sidewalk sales. I was in there yesterday. It reminded me of the old Filene's basement. It was just bustling. Amen? And we joined the Greater Boston Interfaith Organization so that we can make a difference with policy on mental health, on people recovering after incarceration, incarceration and reentering society, of creating more affordable housing. Amen? Amen. And Susan launched the Negro Spiritual Royalties Initiative, <laughs> an innovative, faithful, tuneful reparations project in partnership with the Hamilton Garrett Academy that is gathering the attention of the national news, media, and congregations all over the country. Amen? Amen. And we welcomed in the Brookline Food Pantry so that now we are feeding hundreds of people each week. Amen? Amen. In the last several weeks, a group of loyal volunteers took our big, old, overused, grimy, cluttered industrial kitchen and turned it into a shiny, polished, painted venue just waiting for some good use. Amen? <laughs> Go down and take a look at it. And we have this amazing financial planning team taking a good long look at what our buildings and grounds team has known for years, that we have a beautiful, old, tired building in need of millions of dollars of TLC. Amen? And causing us to ask some basic questions about what God is calling us to do here in this space and how and why we should maintain this pricey, grand old neo-Gothic barn to do it. Amen. Amen. These are all big, important things that we've done just over the past two years. And I step back and I am undeniably proud to be associated with you. Your energy, your verve, your determination, your ingenuity, it's astonishing. It leaves me breathless. Exciting. It's exhilarating. And it can be overwhelming, even exhausting to take it all in. 
Just ask our sabbatical pastor, Peter. We tried to download it all to him this week in four days' time. Plus a whole bunch of other things. I kept saying, how's your brain doing? And I think it's just fine. And I know that I'm instigated, like the son of Helen and Howard that I am, as one of the chief instigators and band leaders. And we're aware that the snowball effects of this pandemic and what it's exposed about our culture, about the divisiveness, about the perniciousness of institutionalized racism, about the inequities of our economy, have been piling up around our eyeballs. And we've been shoveling and shoveling and shoveling as best we know how in all the ways we know where to do it. And guess what? It's okay to take some regular breaks. Not only am I ready to take a break, but we've got a staff that's been pushed to its limits and needs more breathing room. We've got a congregation full of people who've been pushed to its limits. We've got two essential staff members, our fantastic facilities manager, David Dunphy, and our reliable accounting administrator, Don Firth, who have both very understandably given notice in the last month, and they'll be leaving while I'm away on sabbatical. And I have every confidence that our wonderful parish administrator, our human relations team, and our leadership and staff are going to handle this faithfully while I'm away. But all the more reason that we need regular breaks. I'm aware that sometimes, and this often breaks my heart, the reason a lot of us keep doing more and more is because we live in perpetual fear of not measuring up. But we got to ask ourselves, measuring up to what? To Pharaoh's idea of how we're supposed to work? to corporate America's idea of how we're supposed to work, to a never enough culture that says we can never be beautiful or fit or smart enough. No, we are trying to measure up to a God who believes in us, in our inherent worth and dignity. Practicing Sabbath, turning off the treadmill of our lives, letting go of the shoulds and the oughts and the must for a day, one-seventh or 14.3% of our lives is a subversive and radical recognition that we are enough. It brings us back to the reality that we are intrinsically valuable, cherished even, just as God made us. God is interested in what we do with our lives, how we make the world a better place all six days. But God hardwired us for rest and needs us again and again to turn out the lights so we can better see the stars, to remember we are vulnerable and we are resilient. This is what Sabbath reminds us of. Now, I'm about to embark on a four-month break from church work, and it's a great gift that you and congregations all over the world give their pastors. And after 15 years of pastoral ministry and eight years as your pastor, I am more than ready for this first sabbatical, and I am deeply grateful that you give me this opportunity. And you'll recall that a fantastic team in our congregation helped me dream up a sabbatical grant application to the Lilly Endowment that included hiking Kilimanjaro, revisiting a school for AIDS orphans in Tanzania that I volunteered at with my mother 17 years ago, hiking Mount Sinai and Mount Athos, visiting the towns of Paul's New Testament correspondence, holy places throughout Italy and France. Some friends, colleagues, and several of you were exhausted just hearing about it. Well, I'm in a different place than when we submitted that grant application in June of 2020. Our congregation is in a different place. The world is in a different place. I I haven't even had the bandwidth to plan this thing. So next week, we're going to go check in on Robert's parents, who were married in that chapel. I love to remind you. And then for five days, I'm going to go sit by Provincetown Harbor and bike on the dune paths. And then finally, this week, I made a reservation that in two and a half weeks, we're going to board a flight to Israel and meet our regular Shabbat dinner companions from Cambridge for two unforced weeks of just being in the Holy Land. And then somehow, we'll start making our way across the Mediterranean, just like early Christianity did. I don't have any more details than that right now. Thank you. And Robert and I will find some way to keep you updated, probably through Realm. We also dreamed up some ways for the congregation while I'm away to discover the creative spark of God for some workshops in liturgical art, dance, drumming, music, and poetry. And the staff and I have decided to delay that until I return because I didn't want to leave all that to them to schedule if they didn't feel like they're ready for it. 
However, the staff and Peter, our sabbatical pastor, know that if the life-giving winds of the Holy Spirit inspire them, go with it. The same goes for resuming some of the outdoor sacred hikes and strolls, which we already did. Now, I want to note that the stipulations of this grant ask that I have no exchange with the congregation during this time away, which our staff and leaders plan to adhere to. You will be regularly in my prayers, in my singing, in my deep discernment, in my hike, hikes, and in my sitting by the water. I will be thinking about what God is doing here and what God is calling us to do next. Now, I asked Peter if he would just share for a few minutes what he's thinking of as he embarks on this time with us. And I'll just say we were impressed with Peter's questioning us, listening to us, his creativity, and his open-mindedness. Well, I drove down here last Sunday night in the midst of a snowstorm. And as I drove south through New Hampshire, turned onto 128, the sleet turned to snow, and I started gripping and gripping and gripping the steering wheel harder and harder and looking out through the flopping windshield wipers. And a question on a road that night, what the heck am I doing out here? (laughs) Which has been the question of this week, as Kent said. As I've had a wonderful week meeting some of you on Zoom calls, meeting a wonderful staff, sharing with me all sorts of lists and expectations and some hopes and some dreams and possibilities. And with all of that, the question, what am I doing here? And what are we doing here? This morning, we have the very first chance to um, look at each other. with perhaps a little curiosity, perhaps a little anxiety, and maybe a little bit of hope. What are we doing here? What are we going to do here these next four months? The truth of the matter is, as we all know, that we are together for just a mere breath of a time. That it will be over and feel as far away very, very soon as that snowstorm felt last Sunday night. And I imagine we could do a couple of things during this time. You might join me and grab the steering wheel (laughs) as I came down here on Sunday night. And I don't know about you, but I know a lot about grabbing the steering wheel and holding on tight. And it sounds like you do as well. But perhaps this is a different kind of time than a holding on to the steering wheel time, which we all know is probably not the best way to drive in the middle of a snowstorm. But what might it mean to open up your hands? And I invite you, wherever you are, if you're comfortable, just to do that now, just to open up your hands. And what if this is a Sabbath time A Sabbath time of wondering and wandering and of considering what in the world do we do with open hands? What's the possibility of open hands? To meet, to tend, to hold, to be held, to love to receive, 
to receive all that is God. At this very moment, this very breath of time, and to wonder together, what, what might happen in this time together? It's a gift and a privilege and a grace to be with you in this time. And I look forward to chances to get to know all of you. Thank you.